Good morning, everyone. Just a quick check if you can hear me. Okay, thank you for checking in. Let's start with announcements. We've got a couple. So the first I wanna make mention of is since we have an exam coming up on Friday in two days, the day nine online homework, the one that you would usually do tomorrow, you can start it earlier. You don't have to. Uh, the reason I mention it now is it is available and in particular, it's supposed to be, oh, hold on. The screen is not responding. So as I was saying, the day nine online homework is available now and you can start looking at it. It is supposed to be both a review and a practice exam. Unlike most of the online homework, which have, I think in general, unlimited attempts per problem, uh, the online homework has, I think about three to kind of simulate a exam environment. The exam will have, I think around two for most of the problems attempts. And so in case you make a mistake, you, you've got a, another try. That's not necessarily true for all of them, but a good chunk of them, that is true. And there are also more problems on this online homework. I would say in general, if you do this online homework, you're in pretty good shape for the exam. Of course, you can study as much as you have time for and as much as you want, but it's really meant to be by doing this online homework, you really set yourself up to do well on the exam. So you can start that whenever you have the opportunity to. Of course, you can wait till tomorrow, but if you wanted to start it early, that's available. Now that's in preparation of exam one, and I've put some details here. We mentioned some of this on Monday, but just as a reminder, we in particular will not have a Zoom session on Friday. Instead, you'll have the exam, which you have flexibility as far as when you take it. You can start really anytime between eight up to 1134, but if you wanna give yourself the full 75 minutes, you wanna start between eight and 1020 AM. And whatever time you start, you'll have a timer for 75 minutes. Actually, it might even be 80 minutes, but uh, at least 75 minutes, and it'll just time out after that 75 or, or 80 minutes. When you go to the assignment, and it's, it is an assignment, so in Canvas, go to assignment, exam one, and then it will say, as long as you're there uh, at, the, at the right time by no earlier than 8 a.m., then you'll be asked to you know, continue and then enter a password, and the password is simply just capital M math 340. And the reason there's a password in place is just so that you don't accidentally start it and then when you're not quite ready. And we mentioned some of the things that you can use. You can use the Lubble text, the Bennett text, you can use the Desmos graphing scientific calculator, you can use your personal notes. Things that you can't use or shouldn't use are things like Chegg, of course, that's just straight up cheating. Um, and other resources that are, are similar. And in general, I'm not there standing over your shoulder to monitor you, so I'll remind you of the K-State Honor and Integrity System in which you're expected to do your work that's unassisted besides these things that are, that are mentioned here. Now, after the exam, what I would recommend is to, if you haven't already finished with Lab 2 and Written Homework 2, to start on Lab 3, Written Homework 3. They are, are all accessible. In fact, in general, you're gonna find that going forward, the labs and written homework will be displaced in the sense that they'll be uh, more accessible from here on out, as in like we've known the things uh, needed to complete these assignments for actually maybe a little while at, at this point. I have a question here I wanna, wanna check. Will there be any multiple choice questions on the exam? Some of them I believe are, like there's a, I think one with maybe slope field matching where there are multiple choices and there may be a few drop downs. Some of them will be a multiple choice. Some of them will be a straight answer where you fill in an expression like you've done in, in many of the online homeworks. So there'll be a mix of different question types. Another question someone asks, do you know how many questions the test is? 
there are, I believe, eight, but some of them are several parts. So I've tried to design the exam to do two things. One, uh, to make it so that you can show more steps within a single problem. It's not just like enter the final differential equation. I mean, one, that makes it easier for cheating anyways, if it's just enter a final differential equation after solving it. And then two, it kind of robs you of the ability to show your steps in between. So there will be several questions that are, okay, here is a, a, a linear equation. What is the integrating factor you would use, for example? I can't remember if there's a, an actual linear integrating factor one, but you know, I would say, what's the integrating factor? Once you multiply by the integrating factor, what do you get and so on? So it walks this steps. So in a way, it, it's like there are multiple parts for some of them that can give you the opportunity for a quote unquote partial credit, even if you aren't able to solve a, an equation all the way through. And just like the online homeworks, you'll get your grade right away. Like you'll see exactly what it is. You'll see if you get the problems right or wrong, and then that's just it. So you, you don't have to wait at all. And as far as the, to reiterate, the practice exam or the day nine online homework, that has, I think, for most of the questions, about three attempts. The exam will have two, sometimes just one attempt, depending on the, on the problem. Some of the problems, like if there, you had more than one attempt, you would just like automatically get it because there are only two options. But a lot of the questions, I think there are three attempts that you can make at them as far as the actual exam, or two attempts that you can make as far as the actual exam. So that's exam one, and then yeah, I recommend trying to get into lab three, written homework three this weekend, because if you, if you can get to that, then you'll essentially set yourself up to be ahead of the curve for the rest of the written assignments if you just keep that schedule. And then whatever questions you come up with over the weekend, you can then ask next week during open office hours. All right, so that is the announcements. Now let's open it up to specific questions that you have and want to discuss. The big theme will be of today will be exact equations. So we'll get into that. But first, questions you guys have about any material in particular that you want to go over. I'm going to reshare the screen for whatever reason. It keeps dropping. There we go. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions from anyone, so let's just jump right into the material then. Before we go on, I don't want to assume that everyone either has seen partial derivatives or remembers it super well. So let's go over that. And certainly total derivative is a concept that can be easy to forget. So we'll go over that as, as well. First, partial derivatives. I won't get into the geometry of them and, and the deep concept, but suffice to say for us, what we need to do is just compute some partial derivatives and essentially do a, a check of expressions. So computing a partial derivative, the idea is essentially that we'll consider one of the variables to be constant, or all of the variables except one to be constant.
So treat all variables as constant, except the one that you're taking the derivative with respect to. Example, if we have a multivariable expression, such as three x squared y, for instance, and we want to take the partial derivative of this. We've got two variables in this expression, x and y, though it could be a function, or we could think of it as a function of more variables, just without those variables present. But for now, let's just consider this a function of x and y. If it is a function of x and y, and we don't assume there to be any other variables present or that we care about, there are two partial derivatives we can take with respect to this, at least initially. We can take a partial derivative with respect to x or with respect to y. So in some sense, there's like a little hierarchy here, a little tree. You can take f and then take the partial derivative of f with respect to x, and then you can take the partial derivative of f with respect to y. Let's say we want to take it with respect to x to begin with. Now, like I mentioned here, what we're going to do is we're going to treat all the variables besides x as being constant. For this, it means we can, let's say, focus, I'm going to take this expression, and the only thing I'm going to color is the x squared. And I mean for this to highlight the fact that you treat everything else as if it's constant. So yes, there's a y here, and it is a variable. But for the sake of taking the partial derivative, what we'll do is we'll treat it as constant. It is no different than 3. So this is, for a moment, no different than if we had 3 times x squared times, let's say, 6 or something. The y is just constant, and if we take the partial derivative of 3x squared y, well, remember, we're treating the y and the 3 as constant. And what you can do with derivatives is you can pull out the constants. So we're left with just the partial derivative with respect to x of x squared. And then taking the regular derivative of x squared, we would get 2x. So we have 3y times 2x, and that's it. Then, if we look at, let's say, the partial derivative with respect to y, and we take that partial derivative, what we'll now do is focus only on the y, and then we'll treat the 3x squared as being constant. And if we do that in a similar fashion, we can take 3x squared out, take the partial derivative of y with respect to y, and of course that's just going to be, as you might expect, 1, and then we get 3x squared. Now to start with, which partial derivative you take depends on the criteria, either what you're trying to understand geometrically or what you need it for in terms of a larger problem. But you can also take higher order partial derivatives. For example, you could take, and here's where, the, here's where an ordering will matter. You can take the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Then you can take the partial derivative of that with respect to x. Or you could take the partial derivative of f with respect to x and then take the partial derivative of that with respect to y, and so on and so forth. So there are actually four second order derivatives, partial derivatives, I should say. And of course, if you wanted to look at third order derivatives, you would have eight. And the reason there's eight is it's two to the third power because we have two options for the variables and we're taking the third order. 
So here it's like two to the first power, two to the second power, next would be two to the eighth power and so on. So as you look at higher order partial derivatives, you can get a lot of different, different types. For us, we'll really just be concerned with the first order partial derivatives. And we'll be completely looking at just uh, two variable functions here. Now, the other thing that I mentioned is the total derivative. So let's look at that. And let's specifically look at it in terms of a multi, uh, two variable function such as capital F here. So I'm actually even gonna use the same F just as a comparison. Now someone asked a question, will we have three variables? Not here. In Calc 3, you certainly might. You either remember or you may see it. But for us, it'll just be two variables. It, it won't necessarily always be X and Y. It could be you know, S and T or what have you, but there should be just two. But three is, is possible in other contexts. Now the total derivative, and let's, though I just said we're gonna look at only two variable, just in case you're gonna see calc three or just for the reminder, uh, let's consider, let g of x1, x2 up to xn be a multivariable function. Now we say the total derivative is the following. So it is this expression. We say just dg, notice there's, there's no dg of whatever, it's just dg. And let me write that a little neater. DG is equal to the following sum. We take the partial derivative of G with respect to X1, and then we multiply it times DX1, where you can think of DX1 as a small change in X1. Then we have the partial derivative of G with respect to X2 times DX2, and now maybe you see the pattern. And we keep going until we get to the partial derivative of G with respect to Xn, dxn. So you see there's a term for each of the variables. There's n variables and there's n terms here. And every one of the terms is the same form. You're taking the derivative of g with respect to that particular variable or the partial derivative. And then you're multiplying it by this infinitesimal dx1 or dx2 and, and so on. Now in the case, let me move this up to give us some room. In the case here, f of xy, you can think of there, well, there is two variables, x and y. And if we wanna take the total derivative of f, what that's going to be is just d capital F. And now I'm gonna take, notice here g has x1 for the first variable. Here is just regular x for the first variable here. So we're gonna take the partial of the function with respect to that first variable. So I would take the partial of f with respect to x, and then I multiply by the infinitesimal dx. You do that for each of the variables. In our particular case here, we have just one more variable. So we'll take partial of f with respect to y times dy. That would be the total derivative of f if it depends on both x and y and that's it. And now we can specifically compute this. Namely, we already did some of this. The partial of f with respect to x, that is going to be 6xy multiplied by dx. And then we have the partial of f with respect to y. And that's going to be, I think, just 3x squared. Okay, now we've looked at the total derivative, which I'll 
highlight just to make sure it's really clear. The total derivative of G, we looked at that. I'm going to flip back to the last page. Then we looked at the partial derivatives. Now we'll use these concepts to look at what an exact equation is. Now I'm gonna to flip to here, okay. We wanna talk about what is a potential function, a conservative vector field. This just gives some physical intuition or gives some terminology that you'll see more in uh, other classes or you may remember from other classes, physics classes and engineering classes. And then we'll look at a what is an exact equation exactly? No pun intended. First, a potential function. For us, a potential function is nothing but just a function of x and y. This could be more general, where it's a function of x, y, z in different cases, but for us, it's just gonna be a function of x, y. And what we're essentially looking for is a implicit solution to a differential equation that is that potential function where that potential function is equal to a constant. So we're looking at these, these uh, I don't wanna say it, these lines of constancy, one might say, where the function is a constant, like it's always equal to, to C. For example, you might have a case where your potential function f of x, y is equal to x squared plus y squared. Now, if you look at the different constant or the different curves where this is constant, that's like saying, and I'll put it in a, let's say a color red here. So we go x squared plus y squared. That's just the function f. And let's say we set it equal to a constant such as one. That means we're looking at the circle of radius one. It's like this. If we look at, let's say, x squared plus y squared equals four, then we're looking at the circle of radius two, and so on and so forth. So we're looking for solutions. They don't have to be circles always. This is just a particular example. But they are curves where you have your solution function. So notice it's always the, let's see if this works. It's always the solution function here. And that's equal to, when we look at the curves, it's equal to some constant value. So those are the things that we're looking for. Now, what does it mean to be a conservative vector field? You'll see vector fields, or you've either already seen them, if you've taken Calc 3, or you will see them, or maybe you've seen them in your physics or other science classes. But they're essentially much like slope fields with the exception that you can have, you have a, a direction and it's not always thought of as just going to the right. For instance, you might have something like this. Where the direction, you're not always just moving to the right. And moreover, you also can have different magnitudes. Some of the arrows can be larger than the others, indicating a greater force at that point. So you might have something like this, where the arrows don't always go just to the right and their sizes are different. So this would be a vector field as opposed to a slope field. If you are a conservative, if you have a conservative vector field, what that means is no matter what your two points are, let's say one point is here and another point is here, then no matter what path you take along that, you'll have the same change in energy or change in whatever physical quantity you're considering. 
So if you take a path, let's say like this, call that path one, that's gonna be exactly the same or give you the same energy in the end, change in energy, as if you took this path here. One way to think about a conservative vector field is it's quote unquote path independent. And there are certainly many vector fields where if you walk along one path, it will yield a different change in energy than if you walk along a different path. And one way to think about this intuitively is, well, we're going to talk about potential functions. So you could have a field where you could have a, a vector field, let's say a gravitational field, where if you travel down, let's say you're standing on a hill and you walk down that hill different paths. You go down one steep path, uh, down one side of the hill in one case, and then down a more uh, shallow path along another side of the hill. But you reach the bottom of the hill at the same height. If you take the different paths, your potential energy could in theory change dep depending on the gravitational field. But if it's a conservative vector field, it doesn't matter what path you took to go down the hill, your change in potential energy will be the same. But that's because our gravitational field is thought to be conservative. Now, the reason I talk about a conservative vector field, it may seem like it has nothing to do with anything, but the reason we bring this up is from a conservative vector field, you have a potential function. That's why I mentioned the, the hill and the potential energy example. That's definitely the way to think about this. So if you have a, a vector field like this, you can find a function like so, such that it will give you this vector field. And namely, there's a uh, conservative, there's a potential function, there's a f of x, y such that if you take the vector field to be the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to y as vectors at each of the points, that will give you this, if it's conservative. It being conservative means there is such a function. And if that's not super clear, don't worry. Uh, what's more important here is what is the exact definition of an exact equation. This is more to tie it to other classes and just give you some context. Now to be a exact equation, for us what we'll need to do is be able to write it in the following form. So one, a differential, in fact let me say a first order, this is only going to apply to first order cases. So this is exact if two things uh, can happen, if it can be written in the following form. Namely, we have m of xy times dx plus n of xy dy is equal to zero. So we can write it in this form. And we need one other thing, namely the partial of m with respect to y must be equal to the partial of n with respect to x. So two conditions, we say it's exact. If we have this first condition, and then we have the second condition. So to check if it's exact, we first write it in this form and then we check and see if these partial derivatives are the same. If they're not, sometimes we can make an adjustment to get this to be an exact equation or get a version of this to be exact. But in general, we want it to be uh, exact straight away by checking this condition in purple here. All right. 
Let's actually look at an example or two uh, while that concept's fresh. Let's just check a few of these and see if they're exact. For instance, let's do, how about y dy dx plus 3x is equal to 4. The question is if it's exact. So right now I'm making a little table that we'll use to organize our thoughts and then check whether it's exact or not. Okay, now with this first one, we need to be able to write it in that given form where we have something times dx plus something times dy. So it's not that form here. We'll rewrite it. If we do, we'll get 3x uh, minus 4 is equal to y, or not equal to, rather plus y dy dx equal to zero. And then we can think of dx, which is an infinitesimal, as being an algebraic quantity for the moment. We can multiply by dx, quote, quote unquote. If we do that, we get this. And now if we look at this differential equation, and we try to find what is m, what is n, and then look at the partial derivatives. m will be this right here. And maybe I'll put that in perhaps blue. y, put that in orange, so here's m. Here's n. And now we'll just match them up. So we get 3x minus 4, we get y. Taking the partial derivatives, take the partial derivative of 3x minus 4 with respect to y. And just out of curiosity, would you type in chat what you think it is? I just want to make sure you guys are following that I'm not running too far ahead. So what do you think the partial derivative of m is? Partial derivative with respect to y give you a few moments to write in chat here. But again, right or wrong, it's okay. I just want to know where you guys are at. If you're wrong, we'll figure it out. So what is the partial derivative of m with respect to y? Or what do you think it is? Okay, if we think about this in terms of taking the derivative with respect to y, that means anything that's not involving y, any part of the expression that does not have y, we treat it as a constant. So if you look at this thing, there is no y. For the sake of taking the partial derivative with respect to y, this whole thing is just a constant. And if we take the derivative of a constant in any case, that's gonna be zero. So this, with respect to y, is just a constant. And then taking the derivative of a constant gives us zero. So in fact, it is zero. In the same way, with 
y or n, when we're taking the derivative of n with respect to x, there's no x present, so y is just treated as a constant. That means you take the derivative of a constant and that is zero. Now in order for this to be an exact equation, it needs to be that these two, the partial of m and the partial of n with respect to y and x respectively, they need to be equal. If they're equal, it's exact. So yes, this is an exact differential equation because these are equal. Let me get rid of the middle step here. So there was one example. Let's say we look at, how about cosine xy, we'll put it right away in this form, cosine xy plus sine of y, dy is equal to zero. Right away, we have the form that we want. Now let's match everything else up. Namely, m, we'll see that m is what's in front of dx here. So that's gonna be cosine xy. And then what's in front of y here, or in front of dy is sine of y. So we have, let me move all this over a little bit. So we have cosine of xy in the case of m. We have sine of y in the case of n. Now, if we take the derivative with respect to y of this, and again, just a quick check to see how you're doing with partial derivatives. Can you type in chat, please, what you think this would be as far as the partial derivative with respect to y. So the partial derivative of this with respect to y, what do you think it is? I'll give you a few moments to see what you get. Okay, it's looking good. If you take the partial derivative of cosine, or you take the derivative of cosine in general, that's gonna give you negative sine, and it could be easy to forget that negative, so we'll have negative sine. You keep the argument the same, and then by the chain rule, you take the partial derivative of xy with respect to y it gives you just x. So, yeah, nice. Now, the partial derivative of sine of y with respect to x, there is no x present, so that means we'll have zero again. And now these are not equal, so that means this is not exact. Because these two are not equal. All right, so that was just checking whether it's exact. Now let's go to solving an exact equation. Actually, maybe I'll skip going through the process and we'll just do an example. Yeah, let's just do an example. I think it'll be more helpful to do that. And we can see the process of solving it. Here we have our first example where we wanna solve this exact equation. First, we'll rewrite it. If we do, we'll get e to the x plus y cubed dx plus 3xy squared dy is equal to zero. Using the same coloring that we did previously, we'll have the m function in blue and then the n function in orange. If we take the partial derivatives, so here's a reminder, this is m, this is n. If we take the partial of m with respect to y, one way to remember that is you're always mixing the variables. Notice this m function is paired with dx, but then we're checking the partial derivative of m with respect to y. If we do that, I think we're gonna get three y squared 
and then taking the partial of n with respect to x, I think we're going to get 3y squared. So we rewrote it, and then this was that I did here, this was actually the check to see if it's exact. Once you've checked it, you want to do the following. You want to look for a function, let's say capital F. So let me write our goal. Find capital F of XY such that the total derivative of F, setting that equal to zero, is the differential equation. Now, what does that have to do with exactness? If a differential equation is exact, like so, then it's possible to find such a function like this. So that's why we check whether it's exact. So I'll put here a fact. If a differential equation is exact, then such a potential function, capital F, as above exists. So that's how it all ties together. It being exact means you can find a F such that you take the total derivative equal to zero and it just is this. Now, what does that mean if you take the total derivative? So recall that, just from earlier in this lesson, that df, if you're taking df of xy, is equal to the partial of f with respect to x times dx plus the partial of f with respect to y times dy. That means if we take that thing and we set it equal to zero, We're saying that if the equation is exact, we should be able to have this f be exactly, uh, when you take the total derivative set it equal to zero, it's exactly the differential equation. That means, let me really highlight this, that this thing should be this thing. These should be the same if the equation is exact and if we find the right capital F, which means that this partial of F with respect to X, that should be M. And this partial of F with respect to Y, that should be N. So that's gonna be the, the big idea we're going for here. I see a question. Oh, someone asked, how did I get to this uh, from here, it looks like? It's a question. How I got from here to here is I saw that this is a single term. And we can think of the rest of this as its own term. So the differential equation was essentially like this. Now, when we multiply everything by dx, we get the dx multiplied by this expression, which gives us this. And then the dx multiplied by this expression, we get essentially dy over dx. And the dx is cancel, essentially. So just to be a little more clear about what I just said, if we have e to the x plus y cubed plus 3xy squared dy dx is equal to zero, if you take and multiply, quote unquote multiply, everything by dx, including zero, and let's say I color that a different color just to make it easier to follow. 
maybe get something like this. Then what you get from that is e of the x plus y cubed dx. But then since you have dx here and dx here, those cancel and you get plus three xy squared dy and then dx times zero is of course zero. So that's how we ended up with this here from here. Another question is, I'm reading, why didn't you put uh, y cubed with n? Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe that's the same kind of question. Yeah, the reason being is you're taking dy dx and you're only multiplying that dy dx times 3xy squared. So I'm really trying to stress here that you have, this is a single term. So when you multiply through this dx, one of the terms that gets multiplied is the 3x squared dy dx. It's multiplied by the dx, the dx is cancel. And then the other term, you can consider just this whole thing here because it does not have a factor of dy dx. And then you multiply it by dx. Another question is, will we always write them in terms of m and n? Yes, you always want to write it in this form. You can use whatever you want as far as the letters to indicate it, but whatever you call this thing, I'll just call it m here. Uh, and I'll call this n here but you can make up your own letters if you want. But the point being is this thing that is paired with dx, to check if it's exact, you'll take the partial derivative of that with respect to y. And then whatever is paired with the dy, you'll take the partial derivative of that with respect to x. And then checking if they're exact, they're equal. To find the actual solution, you'll want to match it up in this way. So whatever you call these, m, n, or other things, the important thing is that they match up like this. Now I'm gonna erase some of this work just so that we can uh, proceed here. So we've rewritten it, we checked it. I explained a little bit more why the rewrite went like it did. Now let's get rid of some of this work. And actually the goal is, is important. So I'll keep the goal, put that over here. Our goal is to find a function capital F such that we have this essentially. Now, if we think about this, what does it mean? It means we're trying to find an F of X, Y. And if we take the partial of F with respect to X, what we get is this expression. That means that taking the partial of f with respect to x gives us this. So if we take the antiderivative of this thing with respect to x in a partial sense, then we'll get some form of f or we'll get an idea what f looks like in particular. For example, let's take the antiderivative of this with respect to x. So f is equal to I actually might be abusing notation for a moment, but the partial derivative here with respect to x, or the, the antiderivative of this with respect to x, what does that look like? Well, the antiderivative of x with respect to x is just, or antiderivative of e to the x with respect to x is just e to the x. And now again, a check. What do you think the antiderivative of x cubed is with respect to x? Just your thoughts. If you type it in chat and if you're not sure, you can just type not sure. OK, 
Okay, I got a good chunk of people responding there. So if you had, let's say, three, and you take the antiderivative with respect to x, then the antiderivative of that would be simply 3x, and then you'd have a c. Now here, since we're taking with respect to x, y cubed is going to be constant. So it's no different having y cubed or having 3 or 7 or whatever. It's just constant. So we have plus y cubed times x. And now we're not going to have exactly just plus c. But since we're anti-differentiating with respect to x and there's still a y around, that means we could actually have, and this is, can be something that's easy to forget. Maybe I'll put this in green. We actually have a function of y. Maybe I'll call it g of y. Now, why is it that instead of a plus c? Well, it's that because for all intents and purposes, taking the partial derivative of this expression here, it will give us exactly this, no matter what this function g is. Because it's just a function of y, taking the partial derivative of it with respect to x would give us zero. So we want to consider this more general case. Now that means we mostly know what the potential function f is. That is this function we're trying to find here. But we don't entirely know it. To list our steps, there's always going to be two steps for this when you have a a potential function of two variables. So we anti-differentiated and we anti-differentiated with respect to x. And I should say maybe even a little more clearly anti-differentiated m and the reason is we think of f as being the partial derivative, or we think of uh, m as being the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Now this is not the final solution. We still need to find out what g is. And we'll do the next step, which is to uh, take the partial derivative of f with respect to the other variable with respect to y. And we'll write away and equate to n. So you're going to need to use both m, which is here, and then also n. Now if we take the partial derivative of f, and let me even put that in a different color. And let me, let's see what color. Maybe I'll use red. So we're trying to find this F, which I'll color red or pink here. Now take the partial of it. Take partial with respect to Y of F. That's going to give us based on what we have here, what we found. Let's see, take the partial with respect to y. Partial of e to the x with respect to y is zero. Then with respect to x, or with respect to y rather, we get this, which is three y squared x. And now we have plus the partial of g with respect to y, but since it only depends on y, I, we can alternatively write this as g prime of y. Why do I only write g prime? Because g only depends on a single variable, y. So if we take the derivative of it with respect to y, whether it's a partial derivative or a standard derivative, doesn't matter. There's no ambiguity about what the derivative is going to be. If we're taking the derivative and it only has one variable, and we're taking the partial with respect to that variable, it's just like as if we have prime. 
Now we equate this to n. That means we set this equal to n, which is 3xy squared. If we match these up, we have 3xy squared, 3xy squared, and then we have g prime of y. What that means is you have g prime of y is equal to zero. And what that means is that g prime of y can only be, or that means that g of y can only be a constant. So this here implies that g of y is a constant c. And I think I changed these colors here. All right, now, Putting this all together, what we have is that f, which is what we're trying to find, we have f of x, y, and that is going to be equal to e to the x plus y cubed x plus g of y, we found just to be a constant c. And that's what we're looking for. Now the actual solution will be things of the form e to the x plus y cubed x plus c is equal to, uh, I guess, c1, or said another way, e to the x plus y cubed x is equal to c2, just combining c1 and c. So here is the potential function, and let me highlight that. So potential function. And then down here is the implicit solution. Sorry, it's getting a little cramped. Let me get rid of this, get rid of this, and then we can space this out a little more. So we found a potential function, and then we have our implicit solution. Someone asked, is this the final answer? We don't have any initial value. Here we don't have an initial value, so we won't be able to find out what the C2 can be. So this is, the C2 is like, the parameter that we've seen in other first order differential equations where if it's first order we have one parameter later we'll have second order two parameters third order three parameters and so on so this is our, our single parameter for the first order and we could solve for this c2 if we had an initial value but we don't some other questions are so we won't ever anti-differentiate n with respect to y Uh, you actually could go that route if you wanted. You could totally switch everything. Take n with respect to y, and then take the partial derivative of f with respect to x and equate it to m. So if, if you want, you can go the other path, and sometimes it might be easier to go that route. I think it'll, yeah, sometimes it definitely could be easier. So you can go either route. Let me show the routes here. So this is the potential function implicit solution. Uh, let's see. I'm going to erase this just because we did it. And then I'll show the two routes. So you can go anti-differentiate with respect to an anti-differentiate what? Anti-differentiate m with respect to x, then differentiate f with respect to y, and set it equal to n. That's route one. And then route two, 
and they should give you the same thing. You anti-differentiate N with respect to Y, and then differentiate F with respect to X, and set it equal to uh, M. Either one will work. Another question someone had, why was G prime Y equal to zero? What we had at one point was we took the partial of F with respect to Y and we got three X Y squared plus G prime of Y. And then we saw that N is equal to three X Y squared. If you equate these two, so let me move this up for some room. If you equate partial of F with respect to Y and N, and they should be equal, you'll get three X Y squared is equal to three X Y squared plus G prime of Y. And then if you just do a subtraction of three X Y squared on each side, that will give you that G prime of Y is equal to zero. Another question that was asked, how did you go from the potential function to the implicit solution? Once you have the potential function, all you do is you set that equal to some constant. So you say f of x, y is equal to a constant, let's say c1. And if you do that, in this case, that's like saying e to the x plus y cubed x plus c is equal to c1, just substituting f for this expression. Then if you subtract c from c1, you'll get c2. So c2 is c1 minus c. I just combine these two to get c. And then the another question is, Will there be a trick to tell which will be easier overall of these two routes that we mentioned here? It's a good question. Not one that I'm immediately thinking of besides just looking at the two and then saying, which is an antiderivative that seems like it'll be quicker, just looking at it real quick. For example, I look at this, take the antiderivative with respect to x, seems easy enough. Uh, same thing here, take the antiderivative with respect to y, seems easy enough. Neither one of these are standouts. But in some cases, just looking at them, you'll see, oh, to take the antiderivative of this, maybe it's going to be somewhat difficult, but this I can do right away. So just having a quick look at them and trying to think in your mind which you can do the antiderivative of. But there's no like hard and fast trick to saying, for sure, this one will be easier than the other. It's just what can you kind of do immediately or seems accessible? All right, that's this one. Let's look at another example right away. So we'll look at example two. Oh, actually I wanna go back. Checking for singular solutions. If we think about a singular solution, that would be something of the form y is equal to k. If you substitute that in to this equation, if you take the derivative of y with respect to uh, x, that is we just take this derivative, you, and k is constant, you'll get zero. And then you'll have e to the x uh, plus k cubed is equal to zero. And no matter what k is, you won't be able to have k be constant in that case because e to the x will vary as x varies. So in this case, there are no singular solutions. I'm not claiming that's the case in every exact equation. I'm just saying there are no singular solutions here in this case. All right, so solving this exact equation. Now let's see. It's already written in a form where we have the M and N clearly identified. This first expression will be M, then this expression will be N.
if we look at that, and I'm going to kind of go through this quickly because I want to get to the next concept. If we have m is equal to 1 plus xy over y, and we have n is equal to 1 over y plus x, we can alternative, oh, this should be x. If we alternatively write m as 1 over x plus y, take the partial of m with respect to x, that's going to be, or no, with respect to y for the check. So here's our check that it's exact. We're going to get 1, take the partial of n with respect to x, and that's going to be 1. So this shows that the equation is exact. Now, what we want to do is imagine an f of x, y. This is what we're going to look for. I use the same color as the last one. We want to find that such that if we take the partial of f with respect to x times dx plus the partial of f with respect to y dy, that that's going to be equal to zero, and set it equal to zero, that this is and let me try to line it up that it's exactly this thing. Now let's maybe do the anti-differentiation of this expression n with respect to y first just so that we uh, get some more experience checking a different route. I'm gonna erase all this. We've done the check. We've checked that it's exact. That means it's possible to do what I've stated here, find this f. First, we anti-differentiate this term and we do that with respect to y. Why do we do it with respect to y? Because as you can see here, we're trying to find f, but we took f and took the partial derivative with respect to y to get this. That means if we took the derivative with respect to y to get it to undo that, to find f, we take the antiderivative with respect to y. So we did this with respect to y, now we're gonna go back with respect to y. Okay, so taking the antiderivative of this expression with respect to y, we get that f of x, y should be, uh, let's see, ln of y, absolute value, whenever you take the antiderivative, plus x times y, plus some function g of x. I simply took the antiderivative of this, antiderivative of this with respect to y. So that gives x times y, because this is like a constant. And then there could be any function of x. If you take the derivative of that with respect to y, partial derivative, then what you'll get is zero. So this is the most general expression to get this when you take the partial derivative. Now, differentiate f with respect to the other thing. We already did y, so now let's do x. Taking the partial derivative of f with respect to x is gonna be ln of y becomes zero, partial derivative of this gives y, and then plus some g prime of x. It's, it's prime because we're taking the partial derivative with respect to x, g only depends on x, so it's just like the normal derivative. Now we're going to set that equal, set equal to m. That means we have y plus g prime of x is equal to m, which is uh, 1 over x plus y, if you do the rewriting. That means that g prime of x is equal to 1 over x. And if we take the antiderivative of that, we get 
g of x is ln of x plus some constant c. And now we've got our, uh, let me maybe write it here. We've got our f completely. f of x, y is equal to, we said ln of y plus x, y plus g of x is now known to be ln of x plus c. And this is what we were looking for, this potential function. I wanna say one last thing before our time is up, and that's talking about uh, integrating factor. So there's a way to turn a differential equation into an exact equation if it isn't already. And let's maybe just look at a specific example. So if we look at this differential equation, we've got that m is one over y, We've got that n is equal to 3y, taking the partial derivative of m with respect to y for the check. We're gonna get that that is, let's see, with respect to y, one over y, negative one over y squared. Partial derivative of n with respect to x is equal to zero. These are not equal, so equation is not exact because they're not equal. Notice if I do the following though, I take one over y dx plus three y dy is equal to zero. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply everything by y. If I multiply everything by y, we're gonna end up with dx plus three y squared dy is equal to zero. Now if we check the new m, maybe I'll call it m tilde, and the new n, n tilde, that's going to be one for m and for n, the new one, it's gonna be three y squared. Doing a new check, we get the partial of m tilde with respect to x or with respect to y is zero and the partial of n tilde with respect to x is also zero. So now we have that it's exact. The big idea was that we had not exact and then now we've got something that is exact. There's a way to do this using integrating factor. So what we do is we essentially multiply everything by one of these expressions where these expressions can be obtained through these formulas. So I'll kind of leave it there just because we're out of time and you're of course welcome to stick around and ask questions to go over this more, but that's the big idea. Where did I get this Y from? I got this Y from doing, which one did I do? I think this one. So I took this expression and I used that to compute y. So for instance, is this gonna work? Yeah. Using these two, that's how I came up with, with y. Okay, so yeah, that's all I have. You're again, welcome to stick around and you have a good day otherwise. So someone else asked, uh, does it always have to multiply times y? No, it could be, 
the expression totally depends on the problem and it could be something totally different than y. It could be just x, it could be like cosine of y or uh, cosine or you know, e to the y or something like that. It's all depending, dependent on this expression. And someone asked to go back to the last slide. Let me bring this over and we'll actually just do the computation. So I have this here, this uh, differential equation. If I take nx minus my and I divide by m, in this case, nx is going to be the partial derivative of n with respect to x, which is 0. Then we have minus partial of this with respect to y, which is negative 1 over y squared, divided by m, where m is just this. So we get 1 over y. And if you do all the computation, you're going to get a total of 1 over y. Just do all the algebra. Then you're going to take mu of y, which is e to the antiderivative of 1 over y, dy, not unlike the integrating factor with linear equations, That'll give you e to the ln of y plus c. And then from there, with a little bit more algebraic manipulation, what you get from that is y. So that's why I used y. And it's, uh, yeah, that, I had to go through this process to get there. But it could be something totally different depending on what this gives you. And whatever this is, you're simply going to multiply your entire expression up here by that. So once I found y, that was exactly the y that I multiplied. And I'm going to jump to the other slide. That's why I multiplied everything by y. Because I went through this process, I came up with y. And the whole point of this process is to multiply by something such that you go from not exact to now you are exact. So the multiplication here made it so we now have an exact equation. And the solutions are the same. So the solution to this is the solution to this. Oops. The question is, can you turn any differential equation into an exact equation? That's a good question. You, uh, I, I hesitate to say anyone. In fact, for sure it can't be done in, in every case. I can think of first order ones where it wouldn't be the case, like taking the cosine of the derivative or something like that. Uh, not cosine times derivative, cosine of the derivative, for instance. But you could do it if one, you can write it in this form to start with, which some you can't even write it in this form to start with. Then after that, you need to be able to compute what this is, what this mu should be that mu is gonna tell you how to find y. So you'll need to be able to compute that. And it definitely does only apply to first order differential equations for sure. But it does not work for every first order. To view the next video in this series, click the link on the right. To view the last video in this series, click the link on the left. If you wanna learn more about me, the nerd who's making these videos, visit the website below. And as always, have a good day.